Welcome back everyone. So for this section we're going to be working with vectors. Now when we start working with vectors we start looking at two given points. One point is going to be known as your initial point. So if you look on screen I have my initial point denoted by point P which gives us an ordered triplet of A1, B1, C1. And I also have a terminal point here, which I denote as Q, and it's denoted by the ordered triplet A2, B2, C2. We call it the initial point because this is where the vector begins, and we call it a terminal point because this is where the vector ends. So if we want to identify what is the vector that we are working with, identifying or let's say stating the terminal point, the initial point, and then its coordinate systems might get a little tedious. So what we do instead is we identify that we do have a vector and the vector here, let me rewrite this, the vector here is going to be the vector that begins at P and ends at Q. And we put a little arrow above the beginning point leading towards the terminal points. I could also abbreviate this or let's say reassign a variable here in identifying that I want to have a vector and in this case I'm going to say V. So this vector that I initially started with I am now calling vector V. So this takes a place of PQ again that vector PQ. Now the important aspect here is going to be how do we denote the vector in component notation. Notice I'm going to be using the little angle brackets here to denote that this is going to be my vector. Angle brackets are typically used for vectors so that we don't confuse a vector with a given ordered pair or ordered triplet and to calculate the component for the vector or to calculate the x component for the vector we just take the difference from the ending point to the beginning point. In this case it is a2 minus a1 that's the x component. The y component is going to be b2 minus b1 and the z component is going to be c2 minus c1. And then we close that angle bracket to show that this is the vector that we are looking at. So this is vector v, that initial vector that we started with. Now when we talk about vectors, a vector is a very specific quantity that has a direction and a magnitude. So when we talk about a direction, we are basically saying what is the direction that this vector is heading into. Now for R space 2, that just means that we need to take or we need to consider the angle that the vector makes with the positive x axis and then we go from there. However, in R space 3, it becomes a little bit more difficult to talk about that. And we will be discussing that in a few sections as to what direction these angles travel in or what direction these vectors travel in. But aside from that, we need a magnitude. So how do we establish a magnitude? A magnitude is otherwise known as a length of a vector. So I will be using the terminology of magnitude from now on and that means that we need to then find what is the length of this vector. And we typically denote length or in this case magnitude kind of like the absolute value version of these numbers. So in order to find this, what we then need to do is we then need to apply that process to find the magnitude for this vector. Well, to find the length of the vector, all we need to go do is go back to the previous section and find initially what is that radius that we're looking at. That way it'll give us that length for that specific line segment. So in here, this is going to be the quantity of 
a2 minus a1 squared plus b2 minus b1 squared plus c2 minus c1 squared and I take the square root of this quantity that way I'm able to get the length so this is the magnitude of any vector that we're presented with which now again is really nice because if we're presented with a vector that is defined by two points then we can automatically go through and find what is that vector in component notation and then we can proceed to find what is its magnitude great now what if we are presented with let's say two different vectors and we want to talk about the addition of those two vectors well let's start extracting that all right so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep vector V and that's gonna be one of the vectors that I'm going to be working with so let's go with here vector V there we are so this here is vector V now say that I was also presented with a different vector let's call that different vector vector u all right I'm gonna present this vector here vector u now let's say the question at hand was how do I add these two vectors and what is the resulting vector that we uh, that we get whenever we're talking about the addition of these two vectors well in order to start extracting that we then need to figure out what is going to be the addition let's first work with geometrically and then we can extract it to algebraically so what I'm gonna do really quickly is I'm going to extract these two values so let's see if this works out the way I want it to I'm going to extract this quantity here so I want to copy that and let's copy it here perfect look at that I want to move this there we are let's move it right there perfect next I'm going to take this quantity for this vector and I'm going to do the same thing I'm going to copy it over there we are now I'm going to move that vector so that once I move it I will be looking at the vector v plus u so this in here notice how I went about and I added these two vectors or notice how I placed these two vectors I started with vector v and then proceeded to place vector u where vector v ended at its terminal point therefore we can say that the components now have been added together therefore the resulting vector will be the addition of these two vectors themselves so what does that look like and that's what I'm in the process of getting here let's see here we are I'm gonna draw this addition in red that way we can see that this is the addition of those two vectors so this in here this vector in red begins at the beginning point for vector V and it ends at the terminal point for vector U that's the addition of the two vectors now let's extract or let's think about this slightly different what if I didn't want to add V plus U what if instead I wanted to start with vector U and proceed then to add vector V well in that instance I would then take vector u and begin with that vector and that's exactly what I'm gonna do at this moment is is I want to go ahead and I want to add vector u first 
let's go ahead and let's take vector u. Let's copy it over. There we are. Now let's move vector u to the beginning here. There we go. Now we are starting with vector u. And now I'm going to add vector v to vector u. And I'm going to see what I get. Now it should be something familiar or it should be something interesting. if we're doing this correctly. Look at that. On screen here, we can now see if I took vector u first and then I added vector v to it, I still get the exact same vector, which is v plus u, which is the same thing as u plus v. That is really awesome because this tells us that vectors are now commutative under addition. So we want to kind of keep that in our back pocket to say that this is an important result that we look at. And in fact, this is known as your parallel parallelogram law for the addition of vectors, because at the end of the day, it just creates a parallelogram for the addition of the two vectors. So it doesn't really matter what way we add them in. We could do V plus U or U plus V, and we still get the exact same result. Awesome. Now let's start extracting a little bit more results from this. That way we can see how we're going to identify or how we're going to work with vectors in component form algebraically instead of geometrically like we've just done. All right, so what I want to do here now is I'm going to take vector u once again. Let's copy this over. And let's put vector u here on the left hand side of our screen. I'm going to reposition this starting here. Now, what would happen if I want to add vector u plus vector u? Well, let's see. I took vector u and I'm going to add one more copy of vector u. Again, I added the same way where vector u ends. I begin another vector u here. There we are. And let's say I wanted to add one more time. So I'm adding three copies of vector u to itself. Here we are. So at the end of the day, what we get here is we get an elongated vector. I will outline that elongated vector in red to show that this here, vector u, elongates, there we are, to here. So this red vector is three times as long as vector u. So when we're talking about multiplying a specific vector, all we're doing is we're scaling that vector. And that's exactly what this coefficient is called. When a numerical value multiplies a vector quantity, we call that numerical value a scalar. So all we're doing is we're scaling that vector. Either we're going to elongate it or we're going to shorten it depending on whether we multiply by a value between zero and one. If we multiplied by one half, then that means my initial vector u would have been cut in half lengthwise. So we can see now how we're working with these vectors. Now, I want to take one more aspect into consideration. What happens when we consider the negative version of that vector? Well, to answer that, that kind of goes to the beginning here where we started, going from the initial to the terminal point. A negative value just implies that we're going in the opposite direction. Well, if we started from the initial to the terminal, if we went from P to Q, now if we multiply vector V by a negative, that means we're going to go in the opposite direction. So point Q becomes the initial point and point P becomes the terminal point. Therefore, if we want to consider
the negative version of a vector, all we have to do is consider that vector itself moving in the opposite direction. So that's vector u, and here, whoa, sorry about that, and here I'm going to take vector u, and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to switch directions for vector u. There we are. Now this in here, this new quantity that I just drew here is now vector negative, oops, it is now the negative version of vector u. There we are. So we now get to see what is the addition of vectors, what does that look like geometrically, what is the scaling of vectors, and what does that look like geometrically, and what is the negative result of a vector. Well, we got to see that geometrically. What we're going to do next is we're going to start looking at this algebraically, and we're going to start extracting a few more properties for those vectors. That way we can make sure uh, we feel very, very adequate when we start dealing with vectors. So here we go. All right, so what we're going to have here, I'm going to say let u be a vector comprised of u1, u2, u3 components, and vector v is going to be comprised of uh, v1, v2, and v3 component-wise. And we're going to say that lambda, this is going to be a non-zero constant. All right, so here we have this lambda that we're looking at. This is just a Greek letter. All right, that's our Greek letter lambda. So just for your reference, uh, that's going to be how we're looking at this constant here, or this scalar, which is just going to be lambda. Then we're going to say When we take that scalar, multiply it by the vector, call it v, so we get lambda times v, we get lambda multiplied by the vector, component-wise, v1, v2, v3. Now, what this means is, looking at this geometrically, this means that if we multiplied the initial vector, that we like we did here, u, by 3, then that means every single component of that vector must be elongated by that constant, or in other words, that scalar. So when we take lambda and multiply it by vector v, we are multiplying lambda times every single component, lambda times v1, lambda times v2, and lambda times v3. So this is the way we're scaling every vector algebraically. Whereas up here on screen, we were looking at the vector being elongated or being multiplied geometrically. And we're also going to be working with the addition of the two vectors. We're going to take the addition of vector v and we're going to add it to vector u. So let's investigate what that looks like algebraically. So now when we add the two vectors, vector v, we're going to take vector v, which is v1, compo oops, excuse me, component v1, v2, v3, and we're going to add it to the components for vector u, which is u1, u2, and u3. Now again, if we want to add those two vectors together, what we have to do is we have to add the individual components together to make sure that we end up with this final result. Mm -hmm. Now, when we do this, we will end up with the vector addition component-wise. So adding the respective components, we take v1 plus u1, v1 plus u1, 
and that's the x component for our new vector. Next component, we take v2 plus u2, and the last component is v3 plus u3. And there we are. That is the addition of two vectors algebraically. So this is really interesting to see, again, because look at the first component, v1 plus u1. These are both constants. This means that component 1 could be added as u1 plus v1, and we still get the same answer for the x component. The y component could be added as u2 plus v2, and it still gets us the same y component. Same thing for u3 plus v3. It gets us the exact same z component, which again stands out to say that the addition of two vectors is commutative. So not only did we get to see that the addition of two vectors is commutative under geometric standards, but also under an algebraic form. Now, let's look at our standard basis vectors. These standard basis vectors are going to be very beneficial for, for us. So we have our standard basis vectors. These standard basis vectors are the vectors that are of unit length 1 that have the exact same direction of each individual axis within the three-dimensional coordinate system. So the i hat vector has coordinates of 1, 0, 0. The unit basis vector for the y component is known as j hat. And yes, these are called hats. So the first one is i hat. The next one is j hat. And this has component wise 0, 1, 0. And finally, k hat is the last unit basis vector, which has components 0, 0, 1. Now, when we start looking at this, again, the i component points or has the same direction as the x as the x axis in the positive direction. The j hat vector has the exact same direction as the increasing y direction, and k hat has the same direction as the increasing z direction. Now, why do we care about this? Well, not only do these magnitudes all equal 1, which is really beneficial, keep that in your back pocket, because that is a super important feature about these standard basis vectors. Not only do the magnitudes equal 1, but let's consider a vector. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to consider this vector. Let's consider vector, let's call it w. Vector w is going to be comprised of the x component of 3, the y component of negative 1, and the z component of 2. Now, by the addition of vector property right up here on screen, we can take this vector and we can decompose it. We can decompose it into the first vector being added, which will be the vector of 3, 0, 0, plus the vector of 0, negative 1, 0, plus the vector of 0, 0, 2. Now, once we have this in this form, then we can go through and we can apply the first property that we saw up here on screen that says if we have a scalar multiplying if we have a scalar multiplying each individual component, we can factor that scalar out. So look at the first vector here. The first vector was vector 3, 0, 0. That means that we have a scalar of 3. So I can factor that out which means I'm looking at this vector, 3 times vector 1, 0, 0. I can do the same thing for the second vector, factor out a negative 1, and we're left with 0, 1, 0. Factor out for the last vector a 2, and we're left with 0, 0, 1. 
this is really beneficial now because I want you to pay attention to these vectors that we have left over. The first vector, we have a scalar of 3 multiplying it, but isn't that just i hat? Which means we have 3 i hat. Next vector here, minus 1 multiplied by j hat. And finally, plus 2 times k hat which means vector w is equal to component form 3, negative 1, 2 using these angle break, uh, brackets and it's also in component form equal to 3 times i hat minus j hat plus 2 k hat. So as we proceed through the course I am going to give these vectors in different forms and these are some of the different forms that I will be giving the vectors in. So make sure that you are familiar with those two vectors. That way, once we proceed through the course, we're not getting too lost within the notation. Now let's talk about another important feature. We're going to be talking about a unit basis vector, or sorry, a unit vector. Right up here on screen, I wrote that we had a standard basis vector. And they are standard basis vectors, however, I will call them standard unit vectors. Because at the end of the day, their magnitudes are 1, which means they are unit vectors. But what does that mean if a vector is not in unit vector form? So here, I'm going to say that given vector A, its unit basis vector, or its unit vector, is going to be denoted as u, just to denote for unit. Now, technically, it could be any other variable that you choose, as long as it's a vector, other than the one chosen itself. And what we're going to do is we're going to divide by its magnitude. So we take 1 divided by the magnitude of the initial vector a, and then we multiply it by vector a itself. In other words, we get vector a divided by its own magnitude. And this is how we find it to be a unit vector. So using this definition now, I want to go through and I want to now extract, or I want to do an example, find the unit vector in the direction of v, which is equal to 3i plus 2j minus 4k hat. So again, we want to find the unit vector in that direction. So let's go through and let's start analyzing this. The first thing that we're going to need is we're going to need its magnitude. So that's where I begin. I want to find the magnitude of vector v. In order to find the magnitude, I take each individual component and I square it. So this is going to be 3 squared plus uh, 2 squared, excuse me, plus negative 4 squared. And then I take the square root, which means here I get 9 plus 4 plus 16. All right, so now we go through and we add the components. So 16 plus 4 gets us 20. 20 plus 9 gets us 29. So this should be the square root of 29. 29 doesn't break down any further, which means we are done at this point in time in finding the magnitude. So to find the unit vector now, all I'm going to do is divide by this magnitude. So I'm going to take 1 divided by the square root of 29, and I'm going to multiply it by this initial vector, which is 3i plus 2j. Oh, excuse me. I'm putting this in a component form, so that's 3, 2, and negative 4. Sorry about that. There we are. Now, this is a scalar multiplying this vector, so all I'm going to do is distribute. So my final result is 3 divided by the square root of 29, 
2 divided by the square root of 29. And finally, we get 4 divided by the square root of 29. Now, if you want to have a good peace of mind, you can then go through and then establish, is this a unit vector? And you would want to then take the magnitude of this vector, and you will indeed find that its magnitude is 1. It points in the same direction because, again, we did not change the direction. If we wanted to, say, find a unit vector that points in the opposite direction, all we would need to do is multiply a negative onto this vector, and then it would change direction, which means this final result would just have inverse or uh, opposite signs. So that's going to be the extent of how we work with those vectors. Now, let's do one quick example as to how we're going to start applying this more to a real life scenario. So what I want to do now is I want to create an example here. And on this example, I'm going to say that I want to find the forces on cables 1 and 2 in the following figure. So that figure I will get here. go so we got an angle of 55 degrees that's great and then I'm gonna have an angle of let's call it 30 degrees here there we go that looks pretty neat so my first angle on the left hand side this is going to be 55 degrees my angle on the right hand side is going to be 30 degrees and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to have this free hanging weight down where the two vectors meet here. And this free hanging weight is going to be 100 kilograms. Whoa. Here we are. So that's going to be 100 kilograms. Now, cable one is going to be this cable on the left-hand side. So on the left-hand side, I have cable one. And on the right-hand side, I am going to have cable two. As such. Awesome. Now, as some of you might be looking at this and some of you might be saying, oh, wow, that kind of looks like a physics problem. And you are indeed correct. This is one of the physics problems that you initially tend to look at when you're looking at calculus-based physics. Now, at the end of the day, do we really need calculus for this? The answer to that is no. We just need trigonometry to figure out what this force is going to be or what the forces of the cables are going to be when they are suspended uh, holding a 100 kilogram weight in place. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start then analyzing these vectors. So I have these vectors. I'm going to call vector one, and that's going to be this vector along cable one. And I'm going to use different colors to represent these. So this is going to be vector one. I'm going to have vector two which is going to be cable two. So that's going to be vector two. Now there is a third vector here that is at play. The third vector is actually pulling downward and it's pulling downward, which means that vector is actually going to be gravity. Because at the end of the day, 
the two cables are doing some work in maintaining that weight at the same spot. That implies then that we have this third vector, call it F3. So vector F1, I'm going to have it start where the cables meet the weight. Cable F2, I am going to have that start in the same spot where the cables meet the weight. Cable F3, same thing, or sorry, uh, gravity force F3, same place, which now gives me these three vectors, F1, F2, and F3. Since the forces are canceling each other out because this is being held in place and it is not moving or the weight nor the cables are moving, that means that we are in equilibrium. So that means that if I take force of vector one and I add it to vector two and I add that to vector three, I should get all of the forces or all of these vectors to cancel out to zero. We're going to keep that in our mind. Now, the reason I want to do this is because at the end of the day, I can start now considering each individual component. So in order to do this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an axis here. I'm going to create a Y axis and I'm also going to create an X axis. So I have here my X axis and I have here my Y axis. Now I'm going to start decomposing everything as I need it to be. Well, by looking at alternate interior angles, if the angle one was 55 degrees made in the top left corner, then that means when I'm looking at the origin, this now angle to the left in the pot in the negative X direction becomes 55 degrees here. Same works for cable two. alternate interior angles tells us that the angle made by the weight and cable F2 along the positive X axis is now 30 degrees as such. Look at that. It's looking real good. So I can now start reinterpreting my components here. Now, how do I interpret my components? Well, our components are now going to be interpreted in terms of F1 vector form and its magnitude. So I'm going to need a few things as we go through. So I want you to recall really quickly, and I'm going to put this, let's say, in a different color. Let's say I'm going to put this in gold. Uh, you know what? Gold. Gold it is. So let's recall. Back from trig, uh, whenever we have a vector in component form, say that we have vector v, which is given by a, or excuse me, here we are, uh, which is going to be given by vector in the component A and B. Well, what we have here, and let me draw you a free diagram really quickly. That's our X and Y. And if we have a vector here where this vector V has components A and B, here's our A and then here's our B, they have some angle theta, which means component wise, if we want to figure out what A is in terms of theta, then all we have to do is figure out what the magnitude of V is because that's going to be the length of this vector, which means that cosine of theta is given by the adjacent side, which is A, divided by the side of the vector, which is magnitude of V, which means our A value is just the magnitude of V multiplied by cosine of theta. 
And we can do this for B, which means we're going to get here the magnitude of V multiplied by cosine of that angle theta. And then B is just going to be the magnitude of V multiplied by sine of theta. Now, if you've been following along, well, the magnitudes are just scalars. Well, if the magnitudes are just scalars, then this turns into the magnitude of V multiplied by component form cosine of theta and sine of theta. And there we are. Now, why is Mr. Castro telling you this? Well, first of all, Mr. Castro hates referring to himself in the third person, so I'm going to stop doing that. So the big question is, why am I showing this to you? Well, I'm showing this to you for this reason, that if I want to extract what vector f1 is in its component form, I can do that using its angle given. So as I start looking at this, this now creates my triangle, which now I'm able to extract. I have an x component for f1 and I have a y component for f1. Do I really need to know what they are? No, at the end of the day, I don't. I just need to know what is cosine and sine of that respective angle. Awesome. So for my f component, or my f1, I am going to get the magnitude of that vector itself, so the magnitude of f1, multiplied by cosine of 55 degrees, comma, sine of 55 degrees. Look at that. Isn't that awesome? That's great. Now, for my next vector here, I can do the exact same process. So vector F2 is given by the magnitude of the vector itself multiplied by cosine of 30 degrees and sine of 30 degrees. Great. Now, some of you might be saying, hey, Mr. Castle, there's a red flag. Something's going on that you're not accounting for and you would be correct there is one force that i have or sorry there is one direction that i have not accounted for that direction goes back to vector f1 if i'm positioning my origin for this x and y axis to be centered where the cables and the weight meet then that means cable f1 has a negative component that negative component is a negative horizontal component, which means I did not account for that negative horizontal component here in first vector F1. So I'm gonna do that at this point in time. Oops, let's, uh, let's do that in red, since I made a mistake there. There we are. So I'm gonna account that for, I'm gonna account that negative in red. There we are. And then finally, I have one more vector, vector F3. Notice vector F3 does not have an X component. All right, so that's kind of nice in a sense that we got to worry about that. All right, but that's also going to mean that we need to account for the value that we're looking at, which is headed in the downward direction. Now, downward direction is going to be applied by gravity. So here we're going to take the magnitude of force three multiplied by, well, we have nothing in the X direction down here, but we do have something in the Y direction, which will be negative one. Awesome. So now that we have this, we can then just keep on extracting, or in another sense, we can just keep on working with what we have. So I'm going to really quickly assign different values here because these magnitudes of F1, magnitudes of F2, magnitudes of F3 are going to get a little bit more complicated. So let's start simplifying some of these items. So I'm going to say here, let's the magnitude of F1 just be equal to F sub 1. We're also going to take the magnitude of F2 to be equal to F sub 2. And finally, we're going to take the magnitude of F3. Well, this is actually a really nice magnitude here. Uh, this magnitude for F3 is just going to be the weight that is being pulled downward. So we now got to figure out what is the weight being pulled downward. Well, we know gravity is pulling downward, which means we're going to be multiplying by 9.8 meters per second squared. And that gravity is pulling this weight downward. So 
I'm going to take my weight, that 100 kilograms, and I'm going to multiply it by gravity pulling downward, and that's where this negative 1 comes in. That negative 1 is going to be negative 9.8 meters per second squared. So I have gravity multiplied by its weight. Now, if you remember back from Calc 1 or from physics, anytime I take kilograms multiplied by meters and divide that by seconds squared, I really get newtons. So in here, I get negative 980 newtons. Awesome. So now that I have this, let's go through and let's keep following this equation that we were working with initially at the top of your screen. So I'm going to take F1, and that's going to be this first one here. All right, so let's take F1. So I'm going to have the magnitude of F1 multiplied by negative cosine 55 degrees, comma, sine of 30 degrees, sorry, sine of 55 degrees, plus second vector, F2. This is going to be the magnitude of F2 multiplied by cosine of 30 degrees, comma, sine of 30 degrees, plus the third vector that we established is just the magnitude of that vector itself for the weight, which is going to be negative, negative 980 newtons. And all of this is in equilibrium, which is in, which moves downward towards the zero value. All right, now, as we keep looking at this, whoops, I missed one initial component, my apologies. That initial component is this, uh, that this Newton, negative 980 Newtons, is pointed in this direction. And we can do it this way. There we are. Perfect. So now let's go through and let's uh, figure all this out. Taking the components and adding them respectively, x components with x components, y components with y components, we can set up a system of equations. So my first system of equation here is going to be negative F1, once I distribute in, times cosine of 55 degrees, plus force 2, magnitude of uh, vector 2, that's going to be times cosine of 30 degrees, there we go, plus, and that's going to be the x component here, but 980 newtons multiplied by 0, that's just going to be 0, and is equal to 0, so that gives us just 0 itself. All right, not bad so far. Pretty good, pretty good. Let's keep going. The other component, I'm going to say and. We also get that distributing force one magnitude. So we get magnitude of vector one multiplied by sine of 55 degrees plus, same thing here, magnitude of vector two multiplied by sine of 30 degrees and then we get this one here, so that's going to be minus 980 newtons. There we go, is equal to zero. That looks great. So now we have a system of two equations. Now, how do we solve a system of two equations? Well, that goes back to Algebra 1 or Algebra 2, where we learned how to solve systems of equations. So what I'm going to do at this point in time is I'm going to solve for either F1 or F2. So in this particular case, I think I want to solve for F2 because it looks like it's going to make everything quote unquote positive. So let me solve this first one here. And solving the first one here for F2, so I get that F2, let's add that over. So that's going to be F1 times cosine of 55 degrees is going to be divided by cosine of 30 degrees. There we are, looking good. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this substitution in this second equation. So I'm going to write here, substitute. So I have F1, that doesn't change, F1 times sine of 55 degrees. But now I have F2. F2 is this representation. So F2 is now F1 times cosine of 55 degrees divided by cosine of 30 degrees multiplied by sine of 30 degrees, and I'm going to say this is equal to 980 newtons. There we go, I just moved it to the right hand side, that constant.
So now this is actually looking really nice because this now gets me F1 times sine of 55 degrees plus, check out what happens here. I get F1 multiplied by cosine of 55 degrees. Sine 30 divided by cosine 30. Remember trig? That's just tangent 30 degrees. Not too bad. Not too shabby. There we are. Now what we can do is we can solve for F1. Awesome. Sorry guys, I get really excited whenever the, whenever everything's going right. So now F1 is 980 newtons divided by sine of 55 degrees plus cosine of 55 degrees times tangent of 30 degrees. Look at that. Now, once you go through your calculator and you input all of these values in, please make sure that your uh, arguments are in degrees. So make sure that your calculator is in degree mode. So now we get that F1 is going to be approximately 852 Newtons. Look at that. So what we did is we actually found the force for vector one, for F1. All we have to do now is find the force for vector two. But the force for vector two is already given here. All I needed to do was find the force for vector one. So I'm going to say re-substitute. So now that's going to get me that force two is now going to be approximately 564 newtons. Wow, check that out. That in itself is awesome. So what we did is we now found the forces or the magnitudes for those cables. That is really, really interesting. So cable one has a force of 852 newtons. Cable two has a force of 564 newtons. Now, if we wanted to, at the end of the day, could we plug this in or could we back substitute it into each individual component for the vectors? Yeah, we definitely can. But at this point in time, we wanted to find the forces for the vectors. And guess what we did? We found the forces for those vectors. Awesome. So I hope you all enjoy this lesson. That now concludes this lesson on vectors. Stick around and I will bring the next lesson to you, which will be the dot product for vectors. So I will see you then.